Hi, my name is Sarah Lan, and I am one of the Penn Project interns. Um, I am happy to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Leah Surratt, an associate professor of religious studies at Arizona State University. Specializing on the relationship between religion and migration in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, she is author of the book, Fire in the Canyon, Religion, Migration, and the Mexican Dream. Dr. Surratt is currently researching the role of religion in detention facilities in Arizona that are managed by the private company Core Civic. She recently served as ASU's project lead for States of Incarceration, a traveling national exhibit on incarceration and immigrant detention featuring stories from over 20 states. In addition, Dr. Surratt is a volunteer with Phoenix Restoration Project, an organization offering practical support to asylum-seeking men, women, and families after their release from immigrant detention CPB custody. Please welcome Dr. Leah Surratt. Um, so, I'm a professor of religious studies, um, and one thing that has always fascinated me is to look at the relationship between religion and power in U.S. history. Um, particularly, I've found myself with immigration honing in on evangelical Protestant Christianity because of its deep tradition of uh, kind of an ambivalent relationship to the powers that be in our country. Um, so I've taken that question to immigrant detention facilities here in our state. Um, I come at this as, at a, as a scholar, uh, so in a way I'm, uh, I'm humbled today because I am studying this as an outsider to the issue, um, but I also come at it as someone who has a lot of experience that I don't write about. Uh, that's my, my volunteer experience of doing outreach to men, women who are released from immigrant detention facilities. So I have a, um, you know, I don't necessarily tell those stories when I'm doing the volunteer work, but I get a composite picture um, of things that emerge, right? People saying that their stomachs have shrunk during their time in detention, they can't eat a full meal because the food is so terrible, those sorts of things. Um, I also come at it, another bit of my relationship to power is I'm a granddaughter of a prison warden. Uh, my, my grandfather was the warden of Angola, so I was four at the time, but I remember the sense of being special when we'd go and visit, and I knew he was important, right? So um, that's part of kind of my relationality to this uh, strange and complex topic that uh, I bring uh, to my criticism of the role of religion within the institution. Um, I have up here today images of two individuals um, whose stories I'd like to explore. I'd like to look at their theological interpretations of detention. Um, so we have here two people. One is Diana Ramos, um, the first picture. Uh, she actually lives here in Phoenix, and she was detained in Arizona's Eloy detention facility for over four years. She was released, I believe, in 2015 and now uh, received an, a successful asylum case. I met her through the context of uh, mutual friends with my volunteer outreach in the community. Uh, the second individual you see here is Reverend Tim O'Dell. He is the National Director of Chaplaincy and Volunteer Services for Core Civic, the institution, right, the large corporation that imprisoned Deanna and many like her. Um, so I had the opportunity to interview both of them. Um, so Deanna knew that there was a price on her, right? $64 a day to be precise. That's the amount US Immigration and Customs Enforcement paid Arizona's privately run Eloy Detention Center for each day she was held within the facility's walls. An asylum seeker from El Salvador, she was held at Eloy for over four years. During that time, she became viscerally aware that the facility's managing company, Core Civic, was garnering profits by cutting the costs of meals, medical care, and psychological services. She spoke of being served food so poor that it induced nausea, of being issued clothes that had been laundered with mops reeking of chemicals. She watched her peers struggle with depression and suicidal thoughts, only to be told to drink more water, to stay hydrated by the, by the psychologists. Um, yet Diana had persisted with her asylum case. Imagine 50 months, she said later, how, how much can you imagine they made off of me, they earned off of me? It's a business, a big business. 
So as many of you know, immigrant detention is a growth industry in the United States. Uh, in the mid-90s, approximately 5,000 immigrants were held in detention facilities at any given time. By 2018, ICE proposed a target of over 51,000 beds. Underlying that growth is a federal quota requiring that at least 34,000 beds be reserved for immigrants in detention facilities at any given time. Um, this is partly backed by the lobbying of the private press, prisons uh, corporation, or, or private corrections industry. We've seen that influence in how SB 1070 played out here in our, our state of Arizona. Um, so Diana had been sitting on the stark steel-framed bed that she shared with a cellmate when she experienced one in a series of visions that would dramatically transform her time there. She says she'd been gazing down at the mattress when suddenly she says, quote, I saw the stars were there in my bed. And I remember the promise that was made to Abraham that he was going to be the father of nations. In an instant, that bunk, that unit in the ongoing negotiation of bodies and bed space that characterizes the detention re regime had become a portal to the infinite. The vision came during a period of intensive fasting and prayer. You see, a few weeks earlier, another detainee, another woman had approached her. That woman served as an unofficial faith leader in their pod, and this is very much within the tradition of Central American Pentecostalism, sort of that Latin American Pentecostal tradition. She'd chosen Diana to replace her when it came time for her own release. And Diana had accepted the challenge. Um, she immersed herself in Bible study. She was visited by additional visions. There was a flower that dazzled her with its colorful petals. She said, deep purple at the edges and in the center bright violet, oh, how it shone, and a tree that brimmed with fresh leaves and fruit native to her home of El Salvador. Um, but some of these visions, the most powerful ones, didn't come just to her alone, but collectively. Outdoors in the recreation area where she would gather with, oh, that's a vision of stars. I guess you can't really see it. It's too, too dark in here. But um, Where she would gather with other um, women to pray. Huh. So as Core Civic expanded its um, operations to include ICE-contracted facilities like Eloy, it gradually extended a prison ministry system that was designed for the general prison population toward those in immigration detention. And for Core Civic, although on the books they need to relate to as many different faiths as possible under federal guidelines, many of the groups they actually have the most vigorous partnership are um, uh, grounded in more of a conservative evangelical Protestant tradition. But laden with administrative work, chaplains and detention centers rely heavily on outside volunteers. Those volunteers can't, um, can only lead services of short duration. They cannot touch or hug detainees. Um, so many detainees like, like Diana have taken it upon themselves to organize outdoor worship services of their own, gathering in dirt floored recreation yards and circled by chain link like the one you see here. They'll sing preach, clap hands, and pray in a style that draws upon Latin American Pentecostal tradition, although people from other faiths do sometimes participate. Um, so I met Diana in the fall of 2015, months after her release. The following spring, I traveled to Nashville, Tennessee, headquarters of Core Civic, or um, Corrections Corporation of America at that time, Part mini fortress, part Vegas style glass and concrete facade, the four story building curves inward around a central fountain and tightly manicured grounds. I was there to meet with Tim O'Dell, the company's national director of chaplaincy. Um, as I entered there, I expected a rehearsed public relations style speech about policy, about the challenges of balancing inmates' religious needs with safety and security concerns. Um, and it, Dean, that's what I got at first. Um, but perhaps due to the sincerity of my interest in religion or perhaps because of introducing myself with relationship to my grandfather, the, the prison warden, the veneer of formality soon gave way to a raw testimony about eternal realities and absolute truths. Odell spoke with sincerity and affection for the many people he'd ministered to in prisons 
At one time, as he spoke of a man he'd ministered to on death row, he even broke down into tears. His take on it is that prisons are meeting people where they're undergoing, he said, what may be the most intense crisis of their lives. Within that context, the role of chaplains is to serve as brokers of hope. While he said that it's not chaplains' role to convince everyone to become Christians, he stressed that the most powerful hope, the most unshakable peace, is that which comes from facing the reality of original sin, the inevitability of divine judgment, and the mystery of divine providence. Um, so again today, I want to hold up the stories of these two religious leaders side by side. Um, both are grounded in some sort of evangelical Protestant Christianity, a biblically literalist Christianity leans toward the conservative side. Um, both have come to see the challenges of incarceration as an all-encompassing right, challenge to the body, mind, and soul that can catalyze spiritual change. But obviously where they differ is on the material and economic realities of incarceration. Um, and here I'm talking not just about the big business of immigration detention, but also to what uh, some scholars Conlon and Yemstra refer to as the intimate economies of immigrant detention. That is the many overlapping, uh, often overlooked ways that profit is obtained from people's experience, from food, from hygiene, from uh, costs of transportation, of making calls to family members, the bond system, all of those many pieces that play a role in the human and economic experience. So no longer just a source of expendable labor, immigrants in the current US detention regime have become commodities. While they might work um, voluntarily for a dollar a day, they've become to the system profitable as bodies that are managed and transferred to maximize bed space in an intricate dance between ICE munici municipal governments and the private sector. Indeed, and this is through the context of my volunteer work and various facility tours, I've heard ICE officials use the term bodies. That's how they talk about the capacity, the number of people processed today. On our tour, they said, yeah, we process so and so many thousand bo bodies. And then he corrected himself and said people, right? But it, it, it shows us that that's part of the company lingo. Um, so I want to hone in and take a closer look at what these two individuals have to say about those material realities of detention. And what, if anything, that might reveal about the commoditization of human beings that I think lies at the heart of the story. So first, to take a look at Odell. Let's see where I want to start here. Um, born a mere two pounds and so many ounces, he said, he states he never should have survived the 1940s Western Kentucky world of his birth. The brother who'd come before him had perished, as did the sister who came after a sense of the precariousness of this earthly life, as well as the ultimate certainty of final judgment, animates his word. He says we're all facing the same inevitable end. The question is, are we ready for that inevitability? Odell became director of chaplaincy and volunteer services for Corps Civic in 2009. Before that, he served as a state trooper, assistant warden, and warden of three correctional institutions in Oklahoma, Minnesota, and North Carolina. He was first ordained in the Southern Baptist Church and later in an independent fellowship. When I asked him about his language abilities due to the fact that his company oversees about a dozen immigrant facilities, he said, he claims fluency in English and hillbilly, but my first language is hillbilly. Um, so in Odell's own words, the crux of the chaplain's work involves reaching people within the life crisis of incarceration. So I wanna draw uh, more deeply on some texts that influence him uh, as he characterizes that life crisis. And he draws really heavily on this text by Lenny Spital, Prison Ministry, Understanding Prison Culture Inside and Out. Um, he also wrote his own text, Correctional Chaplaincy, so I'm drawing upon kind of these two as well as our interview. Um, how does he describe that life crisis? He says, think about it for a moment. You're cut off from the things that you're accustomed to. You don't get to choose what to wear. You don't get to choose what to eat. All choice is taken away. Prisons are places devoid of love, marked by a relentless sea of harsh harshness, that's from the Spital text, lacking soft textures and the comfort of human touch. The prisoner's at war with time, he can fight it, he can attempt to fool it, but he can't defeat it. All these factors give rise to intense frustration. 
And Odell puts it in his Correctional Chaplaincy Handbook that just as missionaries embark to serve in a foreign land, correctional chaplains have, to, have chosen to serve in an alien environment and culture marked by pervasive distrust and fear, right? that there's a jungle, men, jungle warfare mentality, so it's almost like they have to prepare themselves to confront this alternative culture. Um, and the hope that chaplains can instill is crucial not just for prisoners' own sake, but also because barring hope, he said, people become dangerous. Really gives me kind of a sense of the overarching understanding and approach to humanity that he's working about. Okay. Now what strikes me about our conversation is that he made no effort to downplay the harshness of incarceration. Rather, he almost seemed to revel in and lament the extremity of life behind bars. At the same time, his approach obscures the concrete human actions that have contributed to that harshness. He neglects to mention that his employer, CoreCivic, has a vested financial interest in subjecting ever-increasing numbers of people to the very life crisis he so passionately describes. Um, so the company's stated mission um, from 2014 was to provide prison bed capacity, quality correction services, offer a compelling value, and increase occupancy and revenue. Right, in short, to incarcerate more people, to keep them in prison longer, and to find a way to cut costs related to their care. Um, so what is it that allows this man to proceed with moral conscience as the mouthpiece of this large institution? Um, I think it has to do with paying close attention to his notion of original sin and also divine providence. For Odell, for Spital, and other prison ministry authors, Sin is something that connects rather than divides all of humanity from those who happen to be behind bars. Since we're all sinners, we've all sh fallen short of God's will, as Odell puts it. It follows that punitive measures might not be such a bad thing for any of us, for we all have to wake up to the necessity of accepting salvation. Right, so the default assumption here is that human nature is deviant. And in Odell's logic, the common thread connecting immigrants and detention to the general prison population is that they've all made bad decisions. He said, escapist behavior is always escapist behavior. But the doctrine of original sin also goes further. And this has roots not just in this particular approach, but there's a deeper history of Protestant um, Christian presence in US pr prison reform through the 19th century, right? There's a deeper sense that the notion of original sin doesn't just describe individual behavior, but kind of all of earthly existence. If prisons are terrible and degrading, right, as uh, Spital calls out in this, this book on prison ministry, what are men and women doing in cages? It sounds like an abolitionist text, but no, he goes on and said, this is just horrible. What a low state human beings are brought to by original sin. So it's like, like a lamentation, but also an acceptance of that structural condition, condition, because this is just the nature of reality since Adam and Eve's fall from the Garden of Eden, right? Our job as Christians is not to fix this present worldly reality, but to work on the individual soul. This connects us to the notion of divine providence. Um, so while admitting that there were certainly a few laws that he would like to change, Odell also insisted that doing so was not within his power. Uh, he told to me, God has either ordained or allows these systems to exist for reasons he hasn't bothered to tell me. You see, it's not a question of right or wrong. The question's bigger than that. To drive his point home, he drew upon various examples of Christian martyrs throughout history who'd been tortured, burned alive, incarcerated for refusing to deny Christ. The most gripping imagery was from the second century Christian martyr, Polycarp. Um, he told me in the interview, they put him in a cage with burning lye and oil. He sang hymns of praise to God throughout the blazing. And long after they thought he should not have any breath, he continued to sing praises. Now, that's a testimony no one in that area, arena could deny. You know there are at work things here that cannot be described, defined by human logic. So in sum, leaning on the doctrine of original sin, embracing the notions that prisons can prompt spiritual transformation as part of God's all encompassing and mysterious plan, Odell proceeds in his ministry with profound peace, the peace that surpasses all understanding. 
I turn now to the situation um, of my other uh, kind of person of focus here, to Diana Ramos, so someone who is within the very facility that was one of the facilities that Odell is responsible for. Um, so when Diana fled El Salvador to the United States, she was fleeing a decade and a half of domestic violence um, when Arizona's restrictive immigration bill, SB 1070, passed. She was living in Phoenix, noticing that many of the Valley's undocumented members had been afraid to take conventional taxis for fear of apprehension. She started a taxi service to provide safe local transport. Uh, she was apprehend apprehended with the accusation that she was smuggling illegal aliens. Um, her request to be released on bond repeatedly failed due to the judge's assessment that she posed a flight risk. After four years and two months, her stay at Eloy became one of the longest in the facility's history. When asked what she thinks about Eloy, she says, when I hear that word, it gives me panic, fear. I try not to mention it. I don't want to be in that place. She recalls that the facility sometimes served, quote, rotten food, food you can't eat. Sometimes detainees were given chicken that was, quote, purple on the inside, raw. One can get really skinny in that place, she reflected, from not eating. When she first arrived, she didn't have money uh, to buy items from the commissary, so she began to work. She would earn a dollar a day, uh, working for six hours in the kitchen, carefully calculating her options. She would purchase packets of maruchan or ramen soups at 42 cents a piece to supplement her diet. Ramos recalls carefully rationing her toothpaste. The tiny hotel-style soaps that they issued were hardly enough to bathe with. There were times she had to brush her teeth or bathe only with water. So Diana Ramos is fully aware that detention is a lucrative industry. Um, she says they try to detain people for longer periods of time because it means more money for them. Every day they're paid, every day they're paid. Her words convey an immediate visceral awareness that the cost-cutting affects people in the facility at the level of their flesh and bone. All right, substandard food enters their bodies, shrinks their stomachs, literally transforming their cells from the inside out. It's this immediate awareness of the extraction of profits through human bodies that I want to keep front and center as I turn to her spiritual leadership, such a vastly different leadership than that of Odell. <laughs> at first, she didn't come willingly into her role as worship leader. Um, she had not been uh, particularly active um, in religious practice on the outside, but she was chosen for this role. But she recalls the deep spiritual peace that eventually came through this practice. With nothing to do for long periods of time, she'd spend days fasting, reading the Bible. These efforts gave rise to the intensely beautiful visions that she described. A flower, trees ripe with fruit, skipping past it there, um, a night sky full of stars, what strikes me about these visions is how rarely she brings up topics of sin and divine judgment. Yes, incarceration was a sort of life crisis for her, but it wasn't one prompting a sense of repentant and tr repentance and transformation. The overall picture that emerges is one of mystical union with the divine, marked by a sense of ineffable beauty in these visions and awe-inspiring abundance. Moreover, the transformations she describes are fundamentally collective. She did not become... Um, a religious leader for her own sake, but to guide others, to heal others. Um, as one of, example of that, early in her new calling, she'd been praying and listening to a fellow detainee's sermon out in the recreation yard when a garbage can suddenly appeared before her. So it was a spiritual vision of a garbage can. Sweating and trembling, she shared the vision aloud. Uh, the worship leader snapped her fingers, told the worshipers to form a line, and a moment of collective healing commenced. One by one, the, um, those gathered approached Diana to cast their burdens into the bin that only her eyes could see. She said, I was shaking, I was praying, I could not see who was who, but they were all cr crying, throwing things away, throwing away their burdens. In the days that followed, women approached her telling of pains that had been relieved and healed on the spot. She herself felt pain in her body for three days afterwards, but she kind of treasured it as a reminder of what had happened. So rather than using the hardships of detention as a springboard for reflection on the hereafter, although that's a part of it, Diana, she's orchestrating a transformation that occurs in the collective hearts and minds, in their flesh and blood. It's embodied 
It's deeply shot through with biblical imagery of liberation. Diana makes frequent comparisons between the trials she and her companions faced at Eloi and the Exodus story. Time in Eloi's, Eloi was time spent in the desert preparing to cross the Jordan. While she uses the term desert in a meta metaphorical sense, I can't help but wonder um, to what extent the vivid imagery of the Sonoran Desert might have helped inspire that notion. It wasn't the whole group that Moses managed to lead out of Egypt, she says, but some 70 or 90 people. It was a lot to manage, but I thank God for my voice because he listened to me there. So, again, for Tim O'Dell, incarceration is a life crisis that can prompt people to face the universal reality of divine judgment. The bodily suffering and psychological stress encountered there makes sense and might even be beneficial, might be good for all of us within the broader, mysterious arc of divine will. While Odell's theology obscures the processes that help line his company's coffers by increasing the body count of those detained, Diana leans into the visceral hardship of detention to foster moments of collective healing. Her encaged body, with its price tag of $64 a day, becomes a vehicle for soul-strengthening visions of abundance and shared this worldly moments of healing and transformation. Odell, too, loves people, but his own decisions have caused him to exist in a mental prison of his own. At one point, Odell had been speaking about the man he visits on death row. Continuing on in a whisper, he said, he's the reason I do what I do. It's not about immigrants. It's not about criminals. It's about people. But he swiftly went on to say, don't get me wrong, illegal immigration is a huge problem in this country. It poses a major economic burden. Quote, we're throwing away money like it's water. And my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, they're going to have only one chance at survival in this world, and we cannot sustain that. So I recall here Odell's own infancy that he says as a premature baby in rural Kentucky with two deceased siblings, he barely had a chance to survive. And I wonder at how the peace he so fervently prescribes to those incarcerated and those detained, a peace of knowing that all earthly life ultimately pales in the face of divine judgment. I wonder why that peace is not something he chooses to turn to when facing his own visceral embodied anxieties and fears about the threat immigrants pose to the future prosperity of the United States. So thank you very much, yeah, for your, for your attention. <laughs>